and welcome to SCN Summit, Future of the Supply Chain, hosted by Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. I am Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief, and this session will detail the rise of electrification and the critical steps for successful and safe clean technology TRU trailer deployments. Moderating today's session is Don Durham, Vice President of Customer Solutions for PLM Fleet. Don is a 25-year veteran of PLM Fleet, an industry expert on cold chain transport application and regulatory compliance, and a frequent guest speaker on podcasts and cold chain industry events. Just a reminder to our wonderful audience to submit your questions via the Q&A console on the screen at any time throughout your discussion. Just make sure you hit submit so it goes through. And don't forget to check out our downloadable assets page. That's the main portal page that you're looking at. You'll find some downloadable materials from PLM Fleet, as well as premium content from us, our media kit, and links to our different awards for applications. And with that, Don, it's great to see you again. Welcome to the program. I'm going to hand things over to you. Great. Thank you, Marina. Much appreciated. So welcome, everybody, to the rise of the EV machines. I've got a great panel to discuss this particular topic. And uh, we've got Bill Maddox. He's a 25-year veteran of Carrier Transicol. He's in charge of product uh, management over there at Carrier uh, for parts of global, uh, corporate, is global corporation, a leader in intelligent climate and energy solutions. Bill has his staff and is responsible for investigating new technologies and trends, developing and introducing new products. We also have Robert Couch, along with his brother, um, have been engineering and commercializing breakthrough microchip based innovations for decades. AEM is a solar TRU that has been tested for over 11 years. And it's the only uh, TRU that has millions of miles of performance data proving its power and its impressive ability to perform reliability for cold chain transport. We also have Alan Gassler is the Zero Emissions Customers uh, Sales and Operation Analyst over at PLM Fleet. As a subject matter expert on all technologies used to monitor, report, and define zero emission performance. Alan also provides direct customer consulting on matrix and how to best optimize and evaluate successful zero emission equipment with existing customers in fleet operations. So we're going to take a little bit of time right here in the beginning and really look at two technologies. We've got Robert with AEM, who has a groundbreaking technology. And then we also have Carrier, a well-known in the industry uh, throughout the years and providing uh, diesel transportation. And so I want to take this time to introduce Robert to you first and have Robert kind of go over, take uh, a few minutes to talk about the technology that he's bringing to market. Thank you, Don. We um, started in 2009 looking at this uh, product sector and we knew that it was gonna be about power. Refrigeration was well understood, but how to power the refrigeration with electric means 100% was the challenge everybody was looking back 14 years ago at. So we got heavily involved in it and started to run our first um, solar powered units in 2009. We did that with um, 4,000 pound lead acid batteries, forklift batteries really. And we decided early on that because solar panels were gonna be mainstay in our product offering, that we wanted to go low voltage DC. Uh, that's what solar panels are, is low voltage DC, as well as lithium batteries and batteries in general are all DC. So we developed a system 2009, spent, oh, up into um, the 2016 timeframe retrofitting existing diesel units. And so we really studied the power heavily. So we looked at the power requirements because we knew it was all going to be about range, just like your uh, car is all about range on your EV vehicle. That's what everybody's concerned about. So our strategy was to maximize that to reduce the power requirements to run 100% electric because that's the challenge. So since 2012, uh, that's when the first lithium batteries were rolled out. We've been delivering food every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day with lithium batteries. Uh, up to this point now, we're over 8 million miles on the road, which is very important. You're gonna find that when you move into EV vehicles, especially in trailers, uh, there's a tremendous amount of vibration involved. And so that time on the road is very important to shake out your battery management systems, which are quite sensitive systems, really semiconductor-based systems with a lot of small wiring in involved in them. And so all the controls for the refrigeration unit are pretty well understood. Thermal King Carrier have been using that 
for a lot of decades. But when it gets down into the battery side of it, that's where we really had to do a lot of studying. So that mileage on the road is very important. Also for our wheel generator, what we call a momentum generator, those miles are important to uh, really shake that product out. And then from the operational standpoint of making the symphony work between all the solar and the batteries and the wheel generator and the charging uh, for the refrigeration unit to run, uh, we've got well over a million and a half hours now, and that's well over a million and a half plugs as safe plugs as well at low voltage. So we feel like we've cracked the uh, code on range anxiety. If you could go to the next slide. When you look at the reality of operating these things, our baseline, you know, everybody asks, how long does your battery last? And of course, there's a lot of assumptions that have to come into that to arrive at an answer to that question. So our, our assumptions are it's 88 degrees outside, relatively low humidity, and we can get 32 hours without plugging in with no door openings. As soon as you start opening doors, those numbers all change radically and they're very hard to predict with, depending on how long you leave your doors open. That's based on running a multi-temp with eight pallets at zero degrees in the front and eight pallets of 35 degrees in the back. And then of course the back would be bulkheaded if you were doing a third dry zone in behind. So these are kind of important numbers that over 52,000 hours we arrived at that multi-temp uh, that everybody's gone from zero to minus 10 these days. So you start adding door openings for 12 stops. We really average about 16 hours on battery life, which is always enough to get us back from the route back to the center and then get them plugged in. We, we've been running tens of thousands of hours at minus 20. Of course, a lot of people give you the toughest application right out of the chute. So minus 20 uh, is based on 24 pallets and four hours of door openings gives us an 11 hour battery life out on the road. And then 35 degrees, that, that shouldn't be a minus, it should be 35 degrees single zone. We can go 55 hours and in a lot of cases, almost without plugins and just run off solar for 35 degree loads. Uh, next slide, please. So the reality of operating zero emission, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is data from last year, just before Easter 2023. And it's interesting because you look at the outbound average and of course this depends on how well the facility is doing in plugging the unit in as it's being pre-cooled, as it's being loaded at the docks and then staged before it goes out on the road. And you can see over that eight week period, we we're doing real well until a crew came in that wasn't trained. And that crew came in just before Easter because everybody was trying to increase their workforce to get the product out the door. Well, as you can see, some dangerous situations where it goes out on a low state of charge situation. The, the good news is when you look at the second line on the battery inbound, we're able to still bring it back at 48 and 68 percent, even though it went out at low voltage. And that's largely attributable to the solar panels and the momentum generator. Resulted in zero cooling issues over that period, which were uh, several thousand stops. And um, the average temperature, as you can see back then, was 75 and 77. So that's the real world operation of zero emission uh, on a real fleet doing it every day. So we feel like the technology is there and adaptable and adaptable to integrate into your facility. So it really gets down to, okay, how do you integrate into your facility? If you could go to the next slide there. Integrating into the facility really requires infrastructure at your facility, but we also have an option on our momentum generator to where you're outside your facility and you're operating outside of the state of California, for instance, because some of our fleets do that. And this is a slide showing you that we went from Phoenix to Orlando, Florida, uh, just before COVID hit to the IFTA show in 2019 without a plug-in. So no infrastructure required. The unit was able to run on its momentum generator and solar and keep two cavities at uh, zero degrees and 40 degrees through that whole route. So you know that's going 93 hours and, you know, 2,400 miles with no plugins. So when everybody talks about the plug-in being uh, a big holdup to go in EV, not necessarily. Now you move into California, if you go to the next slide, please. I should mention we, we maintained a 75%, nothing lower than a 75% battery state of charge on that whole trip. And that was with one driver taking breaks at night. And by the way, you went through five tornadoes and didn't lose a solar panel. <laughs> next slide, please. So when you get into infrastructure, um, these are some of our trailers that we've got setting at a facility where we have automated charging. And so we've got patents issued now to where we don't need cords any longer. We can actually land these trailers automatically and charge them. So we are heavily involved in the infrastructure. Of course, one of the big things moving to EVs, anybody's EVs is you've got to have chargers in place ahead of time. 
So we work with the customer closely to get that infrastructure in place so that you can operate your EVs alongside your diesels as you integrate in. That's it, Don, thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, so Bill, um, can you talk a little bit about what uh, Carrier is doing in this uh, zero emission space? No, absolutely, thanks, Don. Uh, once again, Bill Maddox, I'm with uh, Carrier Transicold. Uh, we are one of the uh, industry leaders in uh, transport refrigeration, uh, having been in the in the business for over 50 years of, of, of providing uh, temperature control units from vans, trucks to, to trailers. Uh, we find it's important to be able to be able to service uh, our customers as best we can uh, in this industry with and we have over 200 uh, dealer locations across the Americas and that's both brick and mortar as well as providing mobile service and that, that's at 24 7 uh, 365 days a year and providing that ex expert service and support uh, to keep all the equipment uh, up and running and increased uptime there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of our products that we've been very excited about for over a couple decades and uh, is really because it's so future proof is the Vector. Uh, the Vector is an all electric refrigeration unit. And so the compressor is electric, fans are electric, it's an electronic battery charger, everything on that unit uh, runs on electricity. And what we have on there, uh, circled in that red box, is uh, onboard diesel generator. So that's providing the uh, the electricity to, to run the refrigeration unit. And that's because traditionally that's uh, uh, diesel fuel is, is what's used in the industry. So, but in reality, we don't care where the electricity comes from. It can come from the diesel generator, it comes from uh, the grid, or now as we're, we're finding solutions, now the technology has caught up to it, is uh, ba battery electric uh, uh, providing the power. And so it's very easy for us to remove that diesel generator. So as shown on the, on the photo in the middle there, and so that is now an, a truly all electric unit and can be configured to operate off of a battery. So this is proven technology. We've had it for over 20 years. We've been optimizing it so that it's uh, very efficient and uh, minimizing the power draw. And then we also offer other important services such as telematics uh, to be able to track the, the system and find opportunities to optimize the, the, the usage moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one of the things with expanding the uh, Vector uh, platform and, and portfolio is the Vector eCool. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the Vector doesn't care where it gets its electricity from. And so we are uh, work, working with a, uh, an alliance partner, Comet eMobility, have come up with an ability to have a, an, a, a battery pack with power electronics. That's the, uh, the orange port portion uh, shown underneath the belly of the trailer. And then we're able to right size that battery. We don't have to put on a massive battery to, to make these trips. We right size it because we can regenerate it while it's moving. So uh, Comet produces uh, these uh, electric e-hubs. Uh, each is capable of generating 80 kilowatts of power. And so this basically turns the, the trailer into a mobile fast charger. We can recharge that battery within 35, 40 minutes of it uh, of being driven. So you can uh, constantly keep that battery uh, at, at a maximum charge uh, as the trailer is being used. So very excited about the technology and, uh, and continue to look at opportunities for it moving forward. So uh, uh, I think that was my last, last slide there for you and back to you, Don. Thank you very much. Bill, I'm gonna stay with you for just a second here. I think it's kind of interesting when I talk to people that have been using carriers for a number of years and pumping the diesel in there to find out that, um, you know, the electrification that you're really doing here, it's always been electric, right? Correct, yeah, the, the base unit itself has, has been electric. So the, the Vector you could say is a hybrid unit. So it's got the, the diesel generator on, as well as we've, uh, uh, with a standard uh, electric plug, we can plug it in and run it off of the grid. So. Um, hmm. Doesn't care where it gets its power from. Um, it, it can operate in different modes, and and there's no compromises in performance. Whether you're running purely off the grid or off the battery versus a diesel engine, uh, you're going to get the same uh, high capacity and tight temperature control that uh, that the customers are needing. Yeah, and Robert, um, for you, I, I think it's uh, it's kind of interesting to look at your presentation and 
you know, I'm all, I'm almost thinking, uh, you know, like I set my uh, iPhone down to be charged, you know, on a on a pad, you know, instead of plugging it in. Is that kind of a thing that you're doing there? Yeah, it's important um, as you get millions of hours of running these things, you realize the human factor is probably the weakest factor. It's not the technology. And so just like your cell phone example, Don, if you don't lay it down at night and charge it, you don't have it the next day to use. And that's the biggest lesson that, that fleet operators have to learn in trying to integrate. Um, you know, it's a chaotic environment trying to get food out the doors every day. And sometimes people, just human beings, will forget to plug in. And even though you have email alerts and you have uh, text alerts, um, sometimes it just happens. So uh, as, as Bill mentioned, the telematics, and I think probably Alan will attest to, the telematics are everything to try to alert these operators to say, hey, you, you, did, you didn't plug it in. Well, if you've got an automated charging pad and that's where the trailers live, um, that problem goes away. So mm -hmm. that's the number one nemesis we've seen in trying to move to electric from diesel done. Interesting, appreciate that. Uh, Alan, I'm gonna bring you in the conversation now. Um, <laughs> over your capacity over there at PLM to onboard zero emission, uh, really going from a traditional TRU application, why has this on the TRU side become the focus, the zero emission for, for the industry? I think one of the biggest culprits is the health concerns, especially around communities that are located near the ports or big distribution centers. Um, there's been numerous studies that have come out in New York, New Jersey, and California that show that the TRU actually causes more health concerns versus buses and other tractors. Um, another big thing is the overall ROI you're seeing on electric vehicles. During COVID, diesel prices were going through the roof as well as the components needed for those diesel units. So these electric counterparts, such as batteries, actually are becoming more efficient and cheaper to make. So in the long run, it makes more business sense for a lot of our customers. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so Robert, over to you. Um, I know you've done a lot of work uh, the past few years in the state of California imp implementing these zero emissions. Um, government regulatory requirements seem to be one of the drivers here. Can you go on a high level on some of the regulatory uh, climate that you're seeing out there now, maybe even to other states? Sure, in California, um, they, they were, of course, very interested in what we were doing with solar back, you know, six, seven years ago. And there was a, the big question, I think, the divide with any of the state or federal authorities is, um, you know, do we use carrots or do we use sticks? Do we use regulations to force everybody into compliance? Or do we tr try to create beachheads? So my advocacy for the industry was to let's, Let's get as many carrots out there to create beachheads so that people can really understand how to operate these into their operations on their own and not have to rely on subsidies for a long period of time. So we've been very um, lucky to get um, vouchers from the state of California in the core program to create a lot of these beachheads which are existing now. Um, I think moving forward, the, the psychology at the state level in California at least uh, everybody's probably aware that they went to truck or over cab TRUs this year and required 15% of purchases to be done with zero emission. Um, I suspect the same thing will happen here uh, in the years ahead of us for trailers. Um, they don't want to force food prices to skyrocket, so they're being careful, which I really commend them for, and not pushing regulations too hard down our throats, but to just gingerly get people moved into this technology to really understand it, use it, and uh, either accept it or not accept it. And uh, I, I, every site we've been at, we have repeat orders at every site. So, um, you know, I, I think the acceptance level will be very, very high once people really get comfortable operating electrics down. And I, and I think the other states will pretty much do what California is doing. Um, it, it, you have a lot of regular, you don't just have CARB anymore, you've got the air districts involved. And so everybody on the call is probably aware of the where uh, fees and rules that came into uh, effect in 2023 in California. I suspect that part will spread with air districts out through the rest of the country as well. Yeah, I'm hearing like there's like 15 other states that are looking for a rapid deployment of this and they're using California as that template basically. So, I mean, do you see that going forward qu more quickly in other states versus California has done a lot of testing and different things that they've done. 
Um, oh, abs but, absolutely, Don, Don. I think I think you're right on the money there. Um, yeah. You know, whether it's whether it's New York or Florida, kind of impacts it. There's a lot more need for the for the um, uh, BTUs in Florida than there is in New York. So, you know, some of the areas will be uh, adopting, I think, faster than others. But um, cooling in New York is not a big deal in the winter, right? <laughs> right, Alan, right. in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and to Robert's point, I mean. I've had calls with the New York and New Jersey boards, and they're almost following a carbon copy um, mm. ideology as CARB is, um, down to the T and down to their current voucher program that they're looking to implement in the future. Um, I've also had calls with Arkansas and Texas. Those you can look to being kind of the three and four following the Northeast, actually. Yeah. So, Al, I'm going to stay with you since you're you're talking. So. You know, another another thing that looks that that is coming down the pike. I see a lot of ESG strategies. What are you seeing in that realm when people are talking to you about adopting zero emissions? Yeah, it's changed so much since I've gone into this industry. Um, I think every customer I meet with now has their own ESG department, which is strictly dedicated to achieving those corporate goals. It's becoming something that's as simple or along the lines of their own profit margins. They have to meet these ESG goals to make their shareholders uh, happy. And it also gives them a great marketing ploy to get ahead of some of their competitors if they're able to meet these corporate ESG goals. Okay, great. Bill, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, you know, we've always heard those urban myths about uh, the guy taking his family uh, in a Tesla across the country and, he gets stuck somewhere because you know, there's no plug-in or something like that. Um, what's in in fleets? What should we be looking for when we're looking at it, when we're doing an EV strategy? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, there's always with EVs this uh, this uh, range anxiety, right? So can I get as far along as with an electric vehicle as I could with my conventional, whether it's gas or diesel powered vehicle? And the, it's going to be the same it's true in and in transport refrigeration as well. And there's two aspects that I've always looked at is one is there's the efficiency of the equipment and things that we as manufacturers can control and, and add value to of making the equipment operate as efficiently as possible so that we're we're sipping on that battery. And we've been doing that for, for years because we want to be able to do the same on for diesel. We want to sip the diesel fuel so we uh, don't uh, burn and use as much. So that's one aspect of it. But the key thing for for the fleets and, and those adopting this technology is the what I'll call the operational efficiency. How do they make sure that they, as, uh, as we were saying earlier, how did they leave with the battery topped off so that they can maximize their range? How do they minimize the, the usage of the battery? Because some, uh, some of the worst things that can occur with it is leaving the doors open during the delivery because then the unit's just trying to cool the world and it's not going to get there. So shutting off the unit is is a key thing there and there's things that we can automate or and as well as with telematics to look at those opportunities to to say where when is the battery going through a heavy draw and how can you minimize that so that uh this can be successful yeah you know you, you mentioned uh and both of you um are mentioning range anxiety both you and, and robert and you know, there is a range anxiety even with diesel units, okay? If you got a 50-gallon tank, it's only going to go that far, you know? So sure. it's not limitless neither. It's just different. I think that might be part of the, the challenge. I mean, uh, when I first came to PLM, uh, our number one call out was running out of fuel. We would send a diesel mechanic out there from one of your carrier dealers. They'd go out there, the tank's full, you know, batteries all, you know, the, the filter's all clogged up because they ran out of fuel. Uh, because there is no gauge typically on a on a, uh, a semi trailer that goes into the cab where they're actually looking at that and can see that. So I think it's just kind of interesting. You both mentioned range anxiety, but there always is that no matter what technology. So Robert, I'm going to flip to you at this point, and you know, can you share some early lessons that have been learned um, when when these companies are looking to electrify their fleet to help the audience out? Sure, you got to be prepared as a manufacturer to be under the microscope. What happens when you move electrics in, you're, you're operating telematics or telling the world exactly what's going on every minute. And, and so the fleet managers will want to watch this new deployment 
very, very carefully. So every issue, every day is watched closely. So, um, you know, there's got to be great support on site, which we supply, um, and not just for the support of the equipment uptime, but for the integration into the facility to train people. That's a very big part of it, Don, to have on-site people training the operator to help them get through the first few weeks. Then to be there, they'll, you know, it, it's, it's almost predictable how many weeks it'll take until they really get it down to a system. And if, if you're at a site where you got automated charging, then a lot of that goes away. They just have to park the trailer in the right location. Um, I, I think that's the biggest thing, and uh, to um, get them trained on using cords if they're not going wireless, if they're going to use cords, to um, store those cords correctly, not cause damage to them, um, and then to make sure that you've got enough charging facilities so that you're not tying up with dock door with a, a trailer that's been loaded. So you got to go out and uh, do, you know, we do audits. That's part of what we supply is audits for the facility to say, hey, where, where are you going to stage these? Because you don't want to tie up a dock door. So it's just thinking these things ahead for the operators that are busy doing other things. They're not, they're not used to integrating the electrics. So working all on those lines is very, very important. And, and working with any of the utilities as far as working with power distribution throughout their facility. A lot of times you've got to um, uh, line bore under the concrete, get out into a parking lot to a staging area, maybe out to a perimeter fence area, as well as uh, charge locations at those dock doors. Um, that and, and making sure that the electric's cool. Everybody has that question when you first move into a site, Don. Um, you know, everybody's been using diesels. They don't look at it anymore. They, they just assume they're going to work just the way they always have. But when the electrics come in, you're under a lot of scrutiny. And, and deservedly so. Very, very important to demonstrate that the technology can work for the operator. Right. Salo, I'm going to flip over to you at this point. Um, so what are some of the operational drivers that you're seeing while customers are, are looking at potential savings that they can get from using EVs? I, I have a saying that I say, nobody goes green unless it pays green, right? <laughs> yeah. No, you're completely right, Don. I think the biggest operational savings you'll see is your diesel versus your kilowatt output. Um, diesel prices right now, they've been all up and down. There's a lot of inconsistencies. And the overall value you're getting out of through kilowatt output and the cost that's associated to run these units, that's probably going to be your biggest ROI. Um, the next, since we do our own maintenance here at PLM, from a maintenance perspective, we're seeing a lot less maintenance having to be done on these zero emission vehicles compared to their diesel counterparts. And not necessarily for a monetary value, but the overall pleasure that comes from employees who are using these vehicles, since they are quieter, there's less smog that's generated from them, that's also a big win and a, prevent, a potential value for the customers. Mm -hmm. Bill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this one at you. Is, um, you know, so what, what are the, some of the biggest challenges that uh, fleets will have when they're trying to transition from a diesel platform over to electric or zero emissions? So for us, we've tried to make this uh, minimize the disruption to their business. Like I said earlier, we, we want to make the unit operate the same, look the same and uh, as what they're accustomed to today. So same capacity, same temperature control. Uh, but there are there are going to be some differences in, in the operation. You know, do they you know today they may pre cool, you know, with the with the trailer parked to the other part of the lot, you know, under diesel. Uh, on, when they go to a zero emissions technology here, you'll want to be doing that with a plugged in, so you're keeping that battery topped off and, and ready to go. So, the, uh, also when they're using the trailer and delivering, so uh, shutting the unit off so that it's uh, not wasting energy uh, on, on deliveries. Uh, th those are opportunities there to uh, to maximize the use of the equipment. So it, it, it's just kind of learning new 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 skills there and how to best uh, maximize the use of the equipment. And even it can get into the specification of the equipment. Uh, just like you're, you could buy the most uh, efficient air conditioning for your house, but if you have leaky windows or your kids leave the, the doors open uh, in the middle of summer, uh, it's still gonna run a lot. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you added more insulation in the trailer or make sure those doors close, that, those are where you're, you're gonna be able to maximize the equipment and the battery life. Okay, and Alan, since um, um, since Bill brought this up, I mean, it seems like change management that you'd have to deal with a lot of that. And what's what's the role, and how do you help 
people do the change management because we're talking about something different here. Um, and maybe the role that telematics might play in that. And, and you know, Bill brought that up as far as telematics. So what are you seeing? Yeah, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of skepticism when anything new comes into the industry. So one of the things we want to do is provide that line of sight to customers that these products are performing as well or better than their diesel counterparts. So we use our telematics and we've worked with almost all the biggest players in the industry right now to build custom metrics around amperage, kilowatt output, charging times, and various other areas that we can monitor how the batteries are performing as well as how the reefer units are performing to ensure that they're working for the current business practices. And then internally, we've also started doing some weekly and bi-weekly meetings with customers around some metrics such as what are you leaving at the facility? Do you need to charge for longer? Do we need to change where we have the chargers currently positioned to maximize your charging output? So these reports are all available via telematics, and we work closely with operations for our customers to ensure that works for them. Yeah, and I, th I think, too, that as we get younger drivers that are coming into the marketplace, I think they like the cool stuff, you know, the technology. <laughs> and, stuff. and that really plays a part in maybe even attracting maybe some employees that you wouldn't normally get uh, to be able to do this. So, um, Robert, going to switch over to you as far as, like, the decision-making process to go zero emissions um, for a temperature control, what are you seeing out there? How companies are we making see, that? We, we see it largely driven by the board of directors. Um, shareholders want to see them uh, get carbon reduction results. Um, you know, a big thing with us is we, we supply reports uh, every quarter to the customers and to the state of California. And I think, oh, last year in Southern California, we saved over a thousand tons of carbon. Um, you know, and that's, that's with just less than a hundred trailers operating last year. So, um, you know, we expect this year to probably move up towards 2,500, um, tons of carbon reduction. Well, that's a big deal for these board of directors to put in their, their annual reviews. Um, as well as, you know, the, the grocers, for instance, you know, customers are demanding that they go a uh, zero emission. They do something about the carbon footprint. So there's a lot of pressure from both sides. Uh, on the entities that we're dealing with to to move into this zero emission technology. And honestly, uh, at the end of the day, Don, a lot of times what I'll hear an executive say, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, d I definitely, I would definitely agree with that. So Alan, um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, differences and the same. And so, so what are some of those differences and what's the same about the refrigeration unit, the TRUs on the zero emissions? From the aspect of what's the same, the, the ETRUs perform the same as the diesel. They're able to cool the product, maintain that temperature, and perform the same as they would their diesel counterparts. The biggest differentiator that comes operationally when you're talking to customers and kind of putting the plan forth to move forward, how are you going to manage your charging? Or you don't have the units plug in overnight? Do you have to plug them in during the day? Do you have someone there who's able to go out there and plug in these units? The big differentiator, unlike a diesel counterpart, if you run out of fuel, you can send someone out there, refuel the unit and get going. You don't really have that capability with these units, especially on these longer routes. So it's maintaining that charge management and making sure there's enough necessary individuals who have line of sight that can address any issues that might occur. Mm -hmm. So Bill, um, you talked a little bit earlier about hybrid units uh, and you've got that experience for 20 some years of, of doing that. So can you discuss the value, the impact that the EV units that basically or hybrid units that have had on, you know, uh, users in the industry? No, oh, absolutely. And, and we, we've touched on some of this already, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, once again, with the vector, it can either run on diesel or on, ele on electric grid power. So it, uh, uh, three-phase power powering the unit and what you know some of the great benefits are one is it's quieter when it's running on on the electric so you're not running that diesel engine you're also saving that wear and tear on the engine that's the the most maintenance intensive portion of the refrigeration unit um, and also you're sa saving saving that green that you were mentioning right so uh, electricity will run about uh, 10, 10 cents uh, per hour or uh, per kilowatt excuse me and you know you're talking, you know what we're four or five dollars uh, a, a gallon of diesel, so uh, a lot of savings there, depending on you know, where the fluctuation of diesel prices are. Electricity's uh, been fairly stable, so you know, and 
that that saves a lot of wear and tear on the equipment and maximizes the life of it. So it, it's a great opportunity for those that have been able to uh, adopt that that strategy and use the electric electric standby where they could. And so, and then this further extends it uh, when uh, when you're talking about going to a battery electric system because uh, now you're running it on that electric uh, almost 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So Alan, I'm just going to tag, bring you in this conversation and because you're dealing with multiple different customers in different applications, or they're looking at um, ROIs or, or, you know, what's, you know, what's your conversation with customers in that realm? Are they looking for those or they just only want to get it because a corner office said, you know, it's going to need a unit. Um, one of the nice things about the EV space is the ROI makes so much sense right now compared to the diesel counterpart. Um, it's kind of a no brainer. Everyone's trying to think also long term, if there's going to be any legislation that comes down that could lead to potential fines that also has to be thought about, similar to what you're dealing right now with the wear programs out there in California. Um, these electric units offset those points that you would require, as well as we're seeing it generate revenue via LCFS credits and other credit programs throughout the country where you're turning out a profit running these units versus running the diesel. Um, so in the long run, it makes my job a little bit easier sometimes when you're seeing, you know, 90, 95% return on your investment in just, you know, a couple of years. Hmm. Okay. So Robert, I'm uh, going to throw this in at you. So in 1935, uh, Frederick Jones invented the TRU that we, uh, you know, the platform and, you know, so going way back. And so, but now today we've got EV uh, strategies on these TRUs. So what are, what's the profile of a company if they're out there looking at this to, to implement inside their fleets today? Or into the future. I, I think I think the bigger fleets are are the early adopters. Don, mm. um, you know, people that are running a thousand units at California um, are really under pressure to experience EV, understand it, be prepared for the EV future, and move into it now while they've got grants available to them. So I think that's been um, the main driver. There are certain companies that are just they're just zero mission minded. You know, whether they're a, a produce company that's been in organics. Um, they, they tend to lean in heavily on the EV uh, and move away from the pollution aspects of the diesel. So right. um, I, I think you have both both sides of that coin. And, and then they're just like you said earlier, it's it's about the green. It's about people realizing, hey, yeah, it's it's a little painful going through this experience. But, um, geez, I, uh, I like that that cell phone a lot better than my old um, pager. Right. Right. Well, you know, moving in, moving into the future is very important. And especially with younger organizations, it's they see it as very futuristic. All right. So I got a closing question for each of you, and then we're going to get some, to some audience questions. So uh, for each of you, why would a warehouse or fleet want to deploy a zero emission strategy now? Uh, Bill, I'm going to propose it to you first, and then we'll go to Robert and then Alan. We'll end this up. Sure. So, uh, like, I would bracket into kind of two buckets, that, and, we, and we've touched on these already. There's the you have to do it or you want to do it. Those are kind of the things you do as a business strategist. Now, the, and in this one, where you have to do it is regulatory. So, for those that are in California or these other 15 states, those are where you want to start thinking of the strategy to be prepared for this rule coming forward. And, and then, as Alan mentioned earlier about the ESG goals, that's where they come into the you want to do it. So. What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And then that can help you set your strategy uh, because this does offset uh, carbon. Uh, the, the amount of carbon we use on, on diesel versus electric uh, is significant. So, so I, I, and in, in some cases these may blend together because you may have ESG goals and you're in the state of California. So, so I, there's probably not a one size fits all here, but I, I, I think you just got to look at what, what, what are you trying to accomplish and, and this and, and when, and then that, that's where the strategies can come together for you. Sure, thank you, uh, Robert. Yeah, tell me the question again, Don. <laughs> yeah, so why would a warehouse or fleet really want to look at deploying a zero emission strategy today? Not waiting, why would they want to do it today? Well, here's a great little story. I'm at a site five years ago that we had 50 um, electrics in and they had several hundred diesels running and I'm waiting for an executive meeting with the uh, secretary downstairs and she said what are you here for and i said well we're running these electrics over there she went oh wow she says 
you know, I have a little piece of plastic grass outside the office here, and I used to have to sweep the black soot off it every other week. And, you know, I haven't had to touch that for months. <laughs> End of conversation. Get rid of the black soot around your distribution facility. Is that there simple? Okay. Al, I'm going to switch it up just a little bit for you as for your ending. And really, um, why, you know, do I have to do I have to do it all at once? So I got a fleet of 50 units. Do I need to buy 50 zero emissions and wait for that? Or how does this work for that you're helping customers manage through? So no, you don't have to do it all at once. Um, here at PLM, we do have a program when it comes to demoing the units, but we would actually work with you to see what's your best overall strategy for rotating that fleet, um, as well as what funding opportunities are available today. Each state has different funding opportunities, so it might be a little segmented. We might want to take some funding up right now and wait for the bucket to fill up next year. We really want to kind of ladder that approach with you so that it makes the most sense economically and you can get your quickest ROI when it comes to investing in these zero emission vehicles. Okay, great. I want to thank the panelists. I'm going to bring back Marina uh, for some audience um, participation. Perfect. Great job, gentlemen. And to our wonderful audience, if you have questions, um, comments, now is the time to get them in. Um, so let's start with this one to you, Alan. Since you are a leasing and rental company, is there a program to try this technology before we make the investment? Thinking something like, can I rent a Tesla from Hertz kind of a situation? Yeah, absolutely. We have a full demo program dedicated for our customers. We have a 28, 36, 48, and 53 foot trailers, single temps and multi temps. Um, we have a full team that will be there on site to work with you operationally, as well as look at your infrastructure as well as another segment of the team that would get any grant money that we could potentially get from you. Um, we're not segmented just in California. We've done deals and opportunities all throughout the country. And we're even just there if you want, you know, talk some ideas, look at some consulting opportunities. We have a full team dedicated to that. And, you know, we're really here to make that conversion as quick and easy for our customers. So this one is for Robert. Equipment lead times continue to be extended in commercial transportation. What is the lead times to acquire an AEM unit? Do I have an option of putting a new AEM unit on an existing trailer? Yeah, it depends on how fast you want to deploy, but right now our lead times run between six and nine months. And that's not bad because you really need at least six months to really get ready with your site audit and get the infrastructure and charging structure in place. And again, that has to do with how many you're going to bring in, whether you're going to bring in five or 50. And Bill, to you, how will carrier partner with a full, how will carrier partnering with a full EV solution impact the warranty for the unit itself? So as the uh, as we are the manufacturer, we we do have a full and extensive warranty coverage. Now, as part of that as well, we. We spend a lot of time training our, our dealer network to be able to provide that service support and uh, and make sure the equipment is uh, is well maintained and, and minimize that. And a, another thing, just regarding from the telematics perspective, because we are the equipment manufacturer, there's a lot of things we do from a prognostic standpoint so that we can see if something's not operating optimally or where it should be, uh, then we can start uh, saying we should get this looked at before it does become a a significant issue and require more work. Well, thank you, Don, again, for moderating today's session. And thank you to our wonderful panelists for being a part of it and sharing your knowledge and industry insight. And to our wonderful audience, as always, an archived version of today's presentation will be posted at scnsummit.com, where you can access the link that you use to log in today, your registration link, and you can access the on-demand version at that point in time. While at scnsummit.com, don't forget to register for tomorrow's sessions on the state of e-commerce and supply chain visibility. There's still time to register for our previous sessions, including the one we had earlier today at noon with Don on FDA's 204 ruling. Um, there's also um, on demand of state of volume rebates and warehouse automation. Just go to scnsummit.com to register. Again, my name is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive, and I hope to see you again at our next SCN Summit event.